Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Leading with Compassion, Supporting Healthcare Workers in a Crisis. I'm Stephanie adler Yuan. I'm Director of Education and Training here at the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. We are so grateful that you're able to take the time out to join us today. The Compassion in Action webinar series is a program of the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare. We're a small Boston-based nonprofit organization established in 1995. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with our flagship program, the Schwartz Rounds, which is offered in hundreds of our member organizations around the world and provides caregivers from all healthcare professions with a forum for discussing the complex emotional experiences of caregiving. We'll get started in a little bit, but before we do, there are a few things that we'd like to note about today's session. First of all, the Short Center's Compassion in Action webinar series is funded in part by a donation in memory of Julian and Eunice Cohen. This program is going to last for 60 minutes, so we're going to start with a presentation from our speakers for about the first 45 minutes, and then that will be followed by a question and answer session with our speakers. Although all of our attendees today are in listen-only mode, we encourage you to ask your questions and to interact with our speakers with the questions pane on your GoToWebinar dashboard. I'd also like to add that we know that so many of our colleagues are unable to join us here today, but would benefit from this program. And so we will have the program recorded and the handouts and presentation available on our website tomorrow around noon, I hope. Last but not least, as you exit the webinar, you will see a very brief survey that we'd love for you to complete if you have one more minute so we can capture your assessment of today's program. We really do read every comment and we appreciate your feedback. And now it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and our host for today's session, Dr. Beth Lown, pictured here, is our Chief Medical Officer here at the Schwartz Center, and she's also an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Beth. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, all of you, for joining us for today's webinar. I'm very excited to share these wonderful speakers and teachers with you today. I think that you will find this discussion profoundly helpful and moving and really essential at this critical juncture. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Patricia Watson. PhD, clinical psychologist at the National Center for PTSD since 1998. Prior to that, she was an active duty Navy psychologist for eight years. She received her doctoral degree from Catholic University and postgraduate fellowship in pediatric psychology at Harvard Medical School here in Boston. Dr. Watson has written widely about disaster, mental health interventions, early intervention for traumatic stress, resilience, moral injury, and many other topics. She's the co-author of the Combat Operational Stress First Aid for Navy and Marine Corps, multiple versions of Stress First Aid that she's adapted for firefighters, emergency services, law enforcement, and many others. Thank you for joining us, Patricia. Thank you too, Beth. It's a pleasure to be here. And next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Richard Westfall, her partner in this work. <clears throat> Dr. Westfall joins us from the University of Virginia, where he's professor and Woodward Clinical Scholar at the School of Nursing. He's also a retired U.S. Navy captain, PhD prepared researcher and a dual board certified advanced practice mental health nurse and nurse practitioner. His clinical work and research is focused on traumatic stress, occupational stress injuries, and mental health promotion. Dr. Westfall is currently the chair of the Family, Community, and Mental Health Services Department in the School of Nursing at UVA and the BYS coordinator, co-director. Co so we're very, very pleased to have you with us here today, Richard. Thank you so very much, both of you. Thank you, Beth. Really uh, glad to be here and appreciate all of our colleagues coming online. Well, everybody's eager to hear your presentation, so I'm going to turn the program over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, as we get uh, started here on today's discussion, it's important that we acknowledge that healthcare work was demanding before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Some key concepts that are important for our conversation today include that occupational stress is a risk 
whenever the demands exceed our resources, that there is a physical and psychological consequence to stress injuries, particularly in healthcare, that our healthcare roles often compete with other important roles, and this is where healthcare is considered a greedy organization, and that these other roles that are in competition with our work roles are often our sources of positive coping, so we have attention there. And for leaders, it's important to recognize that often the leadership experience is there's a loss of support or a narrowing of peer support as leaders take on roles with greater responsibility and trusted peer support is vital for effective leadership. Next slide. So when we take a look at the leadership roles, that leaders have roles and responsibilities within the context of the organization. And part of this is that we are responsible for making decisions about individuals, our units, and the mission capability across a continuum of stress. And we'll talk more about the stress continuum coming up that there's an opportunity in that occupational and traumatic stress are both sources of strengths and vulnerabilities for team members. And so leaders need to be able to assess, recognize, and really balance those challenges. When we think about uh, occupational stress, leaders must leverage the skills, the knowledge and attitudes of every single unit member, including those that have stress injuries and those that are, are doing well in supporting others and leaders leverage the strengths and the vulnerabilities to build resilience and to conserve those who become temporarily injured or non-mission ready. Next slide. So when we think about uh, stress first aid, uh, back to the, the, the slide, please. The, um, the diagram, back one. Okay, um, I'll, I'll go uh, forward, but sorry about this, uh, the joys of uh, technology. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about occupational stress in, in healthcare, um, I am really off uh, the, the, the slide here. Um, I'm expecting to see a slide with stress first aid, major concepts, the stress continuum, four sources of stress injury, there we go, uh, thank you. So when we think about stress first aid, there's three major concepts that we're working with. That stress occurs across a continuum and Patricia Watson uh, in the last seminar introduced the concepts of stress first aid in that uh, there's the stress continuum where we have green, yellow, orange, and red zones, that there are four sources of stress uh, injury and stress first aid are strategies that we can use to mitigate the impact of stress within the workforce. When we think about uh, the stress continuum, this is a, a way to look at how do people transition uh, through the stress continuum. The green zone is ready, well rested, well trained, uh, absolutely feeling comfortable with where we're at. Um, I, I've heard of this place. I don't know that I spend much time there myself. Um, most of us spend a lot of time in the yellow zone, reacting zone. Both green and yellow zones are very natural. They occur, uh, and this is just a part of day-to-day -day work life. Orange zone represents the potential for stress injury. When somebody has a stress injury, they may feel hurt, they have a change in behavior, maybe uh, an ability to respond or interact in one or more of their roles. And we see that there's a small portion of individuals that can actually develop stress-related illnesses, and that's red zone where we think about depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance uh, dependence. So one way that we can start to use this uh, stress continuum is doing an assessment within our units. And this is an example of how we can use organizational assessments as a type of a stress thermometer. 
in this particular example, we are using data from the professional quality of life subscales for burnout and compassion satisfaction. This is where we can look at the relative risk for stress injury in a larger organization or work group. And you can see in this particular uh, presentation or model that the black dots would represent individuals in a particular unit. Uh, the gray dots are the organization as a whole. And we can start to see where there are risk factors. From a leadership standpoint, we want to foster those activities that yield and support compassion satisfaction, meaning and purpose within the work that we do, because that's protective against burnout. And we want to try to mitigate or reduce the pressure of those factors that contribute to burnout. So you can see from this particular model, the absence of stress is not the goal, but understanding the dynamics of stress within our work group becomes very important. So uh, with that, let's go to a poll and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about your results here coming up. Great, thanks Dr. Westfall, here you go. Everyone get ready. We've got a question on the screen now for those of you who are able to click on an answer to let us know where your stress level is today. So we'll leave that open for a few seconds until some of you have voted. Great, I know some of you might be watching this webinar in a large group and unable to answer the poll. But if you're able to tell us where is your stress level, do you identify with green, yellow, orange, or red? We'll give it another second before we close it out. Okay, anyone else wanna weigh in? Okay, let's see. You know, I'm going to ask our producer on the back end to actually close the poll because my computer is freezing. We have so many people on the line today. So okay. Be able to... so, well, uh, got uh, it? Yep, got it. Thank you very much. Let's uh, take a look at the, the poll. Oh, we needed... Uh, the results. There we go. Uh, so when we take a, a look at this, that we see that the majority of the uh, individuals are feeling, you know, rested, ready to support others, starting to feel the stress uh, uh, energy. Uh, sometimes stress energy is positive; it motivates us. Sometimes it uh, takes a little bit of a toll, but it's normal that in the audience that we have around 24% of the individuals that are feeling the strain and drain and it's starting to take a toll and around 2% that are wondering how much sure more that they can uh, handle. Uh, thank you, let's go back to the slides, please. Okay, and so for those of you that are thinking about what are some strategies that I can use as a leader or as a team member for having a dialogue and helping my colleagues and my subordinates through this process. This is an example of just one tool that has been developed where we've taken the stress continuum and strategies and we've reinforced particularly particular messages or strategies in the green zone. It's important to remind people that you have the focus to help others, that you're in a good place in your life right now, and that good place can help your peers and really be an asset. When we're reacting to stress, this is a time to slow down our breathing, slow down our body, reset our autonomic nervous system a little bit. And here's an example of a four square breath. Deep breath in for four seconds, hold, slow release, hold, and then repeat that a couple times. When people are feeling in the orange zone, the feelings that moments and things in life are starting to get a little bit out of control, a strategy, and there's many strategies, uh, can be to use a stop. Stop, pause for a moment, take a breath, 
observe what's going on, and then proceed with awareness. And then messaging around those that have uh, stress-related illnesses. And this is really about how peers can help a peer, and that is put your information for your local EAP or your support system in that particular um, uh, area. Next slide. So when we think about uh, the stress first aid model, we've talked about the stress continuum and Patricia introduced the idea that there's four sources of stress injury uh, and we have life threat, trauma. One of the things that's interesting about the COVID-19 response within organizations is that the initial response uh, really tends to map towards the traumatic life threat, a sense of hopelessness, um, there's fear, uh, fear of the unknown. So initially we see a mapping towards life threat. Uh, we have loss, loss is a source of stress uh, injury. Uh, we have multiple losses right now, and most certainly for some people who are sheltering in place, the, they have a loss of their routine for work, uh, for others, uh, they're dealing with the, the sense of loss with coworkers and, and time. Uh, when we take a look at wear and tear, uh, that's what maps to uh, burnout uh, within the healthcare uh, literature, and we know that burnout can take a toll. And then I want to draw a little bit more attention to this idea of inner conflict or moral injury. And this maps to uh, the literature around moral distress within healthcare. And when we take a look at moral injury, that there's acts of omission, not doing something that you should have, acts of commission, doing something that you should not have, or bearing witness to violations of core values. And most certainly part of what we're seeing within uh, the uh, COVID experience is uh, significant moral distress and challenges. And it's really important for leaders to be mindfully aware of that uh, moral distress and uh, the, the risk that that brings. Next slide. So we know that these four sources of stress injury start to impact five essential human needs. And these essential needs are promoting a sense of uh, safety, being able to calm and downregulate your autonomic nervous system, to promote social connectedness and social support and peer support, to have a sense of self-efficacy, of confidence that we can go ahead and uh, do our jobs and to do what we need to do, and a sense of hope. Next slide. So from a leadership standpoint, notice what we can start to do with this. Often in large organizations under high stress load, the thought of a thousand different things going on that can really impact our workforce and ourselves becomes overwhelming in and of itself. And we can use this model to take the four sources of stress injury, what's going on at a particular time in a particular unit or with a group of people and ask and do an assessment. How is this impacting their sense of safety? That's cover. Their ability to calm, sleep at night, their sense of social support and connection with each other, their ability to actually execute their job in the way that they want to and their sense of hope in the future about themselves and about the organization. And so leaders can take this framework and start to focus where their activities are most important to make a difference. And where there's areas that are strengths for individuals, that's something that the leaders can praise. Congratulations, you're really doing well here. Where there's vulnerabilities, then we want to uh, think about what are some of the strategies that we can use to mitigate some of those vulnerabilities. Next slide. And then this is the stress first aid model. What is it that we can do as leaders within this framework to uh, go ahead and, and, and move forward and to help our people? And as leaders, we can use this model in two ways. Uh, from an individual support standpoint, uh, we talk about these as the seven C's of stress first aid. There's check and coordinate. This is doing an assessment. I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. Uh, the ability to provide cover, safety, calming, helping people effectively sleep at night, 
connection uh, for those that are feeling disconnected from their uh, social supports, a sense of competence, having the tools and resources to do our job, and then confidence, a sense of hope within the future. Leaders often use this model in reverse, and that is we often start with confidence. We stop in, we check on our people, and then we, uh, if, if they're doing okay, uh, then we, we move on, then we take a look at do they have the skills and resources, are they socially connected? So leaders can use this model in two directions. Next slide. And so what I'd like to point out is that we can also use this model as leaders for focusing our communication and our strategies. And a really important strategy that we can be using right now is under check and coordinate. Often we find as leaders that we want to show up, uh, we want to talk with our people and say, what can I do to help? And there's a challenge with that offer of open-ended help in that sometimes we don't have the tools and resources to help. There can be an underlying anxiety of what if I'm asked to do something that I'm not capable of providing and the support that I, I want to give. So a reframe on that would be to check and coordinate by using help me understand. So you show up on, on a unit with a team, you acknowledge something that's going well with them, and you can ask, help me understand uh, what seems to be working for you, or help me understand what your biggest challenge is, and then listen. This is slightly different than offering an open-ended uh, 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 option of help. Next thing, when we talk about our um, uh, strategies, uh, think about strategic uh, communications around safety. A lot of work uh, right now on the COVID-19 uh, response in healthcare is around safety, both physical and psychological safety. Uh, when we talk about calm, that there's honest communications, we want to grow the green. What are some resilience capacities that we can start to build and offer our, our team members? Mindfulness, meditation, yoga, there's a lot of resources that can really uh, help people right now. Connection, unit cohesion, and, and social support. This is really important when we have individuals that have been tested positive for COVID-19 and they are now in isolation. It's really important if you have a coworker or a colleague or a staff member who's in social isolation that you're following up with them. This idea of social isolation is really problematic. We should be talking about physical distancing and social connection rather than social distancing. Competence is having the skills and resources. We're learning lessons and sharing the lessons learned across the world is so important right now. And then confidence, the meaning making. We're seeing a lot of messages about the importance of healthcare workers as frontline workers and making a difference. Next slide. And so now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Patricia Watson, for uh, additional information. Thank you, Richard, and uh, thank you all for, for being here today. Um, so what I would like to do is just highlight some key points uh, that are related to what Richard's been talking about. First of all, one of the difficulties of this time is that each and every one of you on the call today is in a different location, and that means that the phase of response is different for everybody on the call. Some of you may be in, in, the, in the thick of things and right in the middle of it, and others may be gearing up and preparing for something that still has yet to hit in its strongest form. So it makes it challenging uh, to give any prescription about exactly what you should be doing. I hope one of the things that you've taken from listening to the model is that we tried to build the model in such a way that it would be as flexible as it needed to be for people using it. So the framework is there, but we would anticipate and expect that depending upon where your team is, where you are in the organization, that you will use the framework very differently. And um, one of the frameworks that I also like to refer to in regards to disaster types of responses is called the Kinevin framework. And this is a engineering flow dynamics framework that I stumbled upon a few years ago, but it, it actually makes a lot of sense when you're thinking about organizational response to disasters and public health crises. 
the gist of this model is that in general, organizations operate from a business as usual model. It's a simple kind of framework where you're looking at best practice, you're basing your answers on what's accepted in the field and, and what evidence there is in the field. The, the risk of this is that it, it can create a system whereby it, makes, it takes a long time to make decisions. Uh, there's a lot of red tape. Um, leaders can become complacent in the standard best practice strategies that are, that are put into place. Once you have a situation where you bring a public health crisis or a disaster into that organizational frame, you then move into a different phase, which we call chaotic in this model. And this is the rapid response phase. Generally, you're acting to establish order in chaos. It's a time when there could be a lot of innovation and change because things have to rapidly change uh, compared to how things are typically done. Generally, this moves from chaotic back and forth from chaotic to what we call complex. <clears throat> Once you have some order established, you have a, a period of time where there's a constant flux. There's no clear cause and effect, uh, and you have to go into what's what we would term the experimental mode, where you're looking to see what's working. You try out different things. You get feedback from staff and people on the ground, what's needed, what do we need to do differently? Let's try things out. You have to be able to tolerate failure because you're gonna try things out that will work one day and may not work the next day. And some people say that parenting is in this complex realm because you can do things one day that will work and the next day they will not. But in a pandemic, you could probably be going back and forth depending upon the threat level of different elements being introduced into a system between chaotic and complex and then complicated. When you move into complicated mode, it's when you have can have the ability to bring experts in to consult with people from potentially outside the system who, who either have been in similar situations or have some expertise of some sort. And you start to investigate other options and things that work in other systems and bring those in. And you listen to experts and you welcome solutions from others. The danger of this phase is that sometimes you over listen to the experts and forget that you also have to map it onto your unique system. And so it's still important to be getting feedback from people on the ground, trying things out, and slowly, hopefully moving as the months go by into this back to business as usual. This cycle can become disordered if the leaders in the organization are not adapting to the phase. So if you've got a leader who's still in business as usual mode and isn't comfortable making rapid decisions and, and, and thinking in the moment and getting feedback from their team, you can have a situation where things are taking too much time or people are not trusting the leader, the leader's not communicating enough with the team or people aren't feeling like they're part of an organized effort. And we've also seen leaders in the, the chaos phase who act in a very firm way to establish order and they don't move out of that when needed to try to test out different strategies. They get stuck in this mode of, you know, we have to do it this way and don't move into checking out what else could possibly work within their system. So from my perspective, you, you superimpose a stress first aid model on a Kinevan framework like this, and it highlights the fact that leaders in different phases of organizational response have to take the framework of stress first aid and use it in different ways, depending upon what's happening in front of you. I'm gonna see if I can advance the slide, it, and I don't think that I can, let's see. Okay, so in this slide, and unfortunately, let's see if I can, this is an animated slide. Um, I've also, I just wanna pay um, a little bit of attention to adult development because it maps onto the Kinevin framework and the stress first aid framework as well. There's a whole line of, of research now into adult development. You know, we've all heard that children go through different phases of development. But I think the stress first aid model and the Kinevin model dovetail nicely with this research that's been done out of Harvard, Robert Keegan and some of his shop, where they, they looked at adult development and found that in general, we tend to go through different phases, especially in our work life. 
as adults. And in the first phase, you're a team player. You you seek direction. You get yourself in the car, as as they say. The the your your goal is to try to uh, do what what would help the organization as a whole. And in healthcare situations and healthcare settings, I believe that the vast majority of people coming in have, as I said in the last webinar, have strong values and like to come into a team environment where their values are supported. So the values are often about serving others and selflessness and loyalty and doing a good job and you know being there for others. And socialized mind fits very well with this where they wanna work together as a whole to try to make a better place for people who are in need. As people, you know, progress through development, they get into situations or they themselves look to master uh, situations and get into what's called the self-authoring mode, which is where you're a leader. You have your, you start to trust and have your own compass. You're good at problem solving. You're very independent and you can set agendas for other people to, to follow. You can set a frame and the most benevolent leaders are the ones that are also creative and they think about okay, what, what would serve this organization, what would serve the patients, and what would serve the staff? And then they are good at you know, delegating and having a team work towards their goals. They're behind the wheel. I think particularly in pandemic situations, it's, it's the Kinevin framework and the stress for state framework would suggest that it's also very helpful to, to move into the third phase of development, which is called the self-transforming mind. And here you have a leader who not only learns to lead, but also leads to learn. So they're looking to hold multiple perspectives, hold contradictions in place, who can look at a situation and say, it's good in some ways, it's not so good in other ways. How can we work towards making a better organization, not only for patients, but for my staff? They seek to find problems. They're proactive in talking with the staff and they're much more interdependent. They go out of their way to have short conversations, as Richard said, where they're getting feedback from people so they can remake the whole roadmap and say, all right, we're in an unprecedented situation. Let's work together, not only for me to set some agendas from my vantage point, but also to really more frequently gather information from you so that together we can make this uh, work better, not only for the patients, but for the staff. I had a boss who, introduced me to the self-transforming mind when I came into my <clears throat> current organization. And he was the first boss I ever said, who after having a briefing with me said, Watson, I want you to argue with me. And it was, I was young and it was the first time I'd ever had a boss tell me that. But what he said was, I need to hear your viewpoint. I don't want you just to agree with me. I really want to hear if I'm, if I'm not on track or if things aren't going uh, the way they should go, I need to hear from you so that we can do better at what we're doing. And it's that kind of leadership that I think is particularly required in a time like this. So um, this also in the next slide, it maps onto what, as, as I came into the uh, development of the stress first aid model, I think we went backwards instead of forwards. Um, as I came into the stress first aid model, there we are. Um, no, you can back it up one more, yeah. The military, uh, Navy and Marine Corps, we're talking about force multiplication. And force multiplier is someone who, especially in times of stress, um, is capable of being able to look at a system, look at a team, and try to figure out what would most balance the stress, most balance what's happening with the team. And the focus should be on what you can affect, how can you influence this, and also what you can change your control because you might be an influencer, but you might have very little leeway to actually change things or, con or control what's happening. As Richard said, we are, whenever we give a presentation about leadership, I'm very, very well aware that what I don't wanna convey is that we're putting more on leaders in a way that will make them feel more stressed as well because you also, are a very, very important piece of this organization in terms of your self-care. So the goal is to be more efficient at looking at what you can potentially influence and looking at what you can affect. And that is gonna be constantly changing from day to day, from sometimes hour to hour and minute to minute. So we generally know from the research on burnout 
and stress in organizations, that the overall effectiveness of your group will be influenced and increased by your show of respecting individual individuality on the team and respecting that stress will happen and being very matter of fact about it. You're being authentic and saying, look, I will, I expect that people are going to have stress reactions right now. I myself am not at the same level that I was before. I was actually very heartened to see the poll that so many people were in the yellow and green zone because that tells me that you guys are coming into this with a good buffer zone. You've already got a, a pretty good zone of, of strength and resilience that you bring into this situation. And so the goal would be that a leader would respect that people are operating in different zones of stress. Don't make any assumptions that anyone's in one zone or another. Communicate regularly, and you may have to step that up. And it doesn't mean that you have to spend hours communicating, but quick check-ins, uh, more frequent than what you typically do more consciously giving recognition to people um, in small ways. You don't have to be overly, you know, uh, obsequious about this, but just finding small ways to recognize efforts. If you hear positive feedback, if you hear, uh, you know, families or patients giving feedback, make, make sure to pass it on and seek out any opportunities that you can to raise people up in this. Because what we've seen in the, in the literature on healthcare and stress and burnout and that type of thing is that many, many people who come into jobs like this with a service orientation aren't necessarily um, buoyed up by the very high pay that they get necessarily, but they are uh, heartened and they are strengthened by uh, feeling that they're part of something bigger than themselves, feeling that they're doing something of service on a greater level and that they are um, with team members that they can respect and look up to. And leaders, as they are authentic, as they are kind, as they are uh, effective in setting uh, protective measures and ground rules and clear communication, are a very important part of that process. Okay, next slide. So one of the um, pieces of information that we tried to, to pull together, and it's, it's in your handout that's titled for leaders, is that we tried to give some guidance based on what we've looked at in the literature about leadership and about the you know, stress first aid model. So we have this handout, and you'll be able to look at this in more detail, um, split up into things that you can do early on, you know, what your priorities should be early on, um, such as what I've just said about communication, uh, talking with people, such as what Richard said about assessing and trying to understand where people's stress levels are and problem solve around what they most need. And then we have information on the, the, the five essential elements or needs and uh, split up into questions you could ask, statements you could give. You know, so for instance, for cover, questions might be, how, how are you all doing in terms of your sense of safety? The statements might be, we are committed to our employees' health and well-being. Here's what we're doing to keep you safe. And you may need to be very authentic about this and also talk about your limitations and what you're trying to do and let them know why it might not be up to what you or they would like it to be and, and let them know that you're continuing to work on that. And then um, actions. So actions might be giving your best understanding of what the timelines are and any variables that you are aware of. And we've seen leaders be very creative in situations of ongoing threat like this where they they might assign somebody on the team who maybe isn't able to do everything that they typically do. They might assign that person to just research what other hospitals, what other healthcare systems are doing, maybe people who are farther ahead in the time frame. And, and go online and find out what people are doing so that they're getting briefings about that. Uh, there's lots of different ways that leaders can delegate tasks like that so that they have a better sense of what might be most helpful for their team. So we have, in, in the same way with, with cover, we have questions, statements, and actions for each of the five core, core elements in this document. And then we have some guidance about extended efforts. And we, we, we say in general, it's important to be flexible with, with yourself and with your employees. Know that none of you are necessarily going to be at your best right now and convey that 
uh, it's very important that you're all patient with the, with yourselves and each other, acknowledging the multiple stressors, not making any assumptions, maybe maybe having a, a whiteboard or some place where people can can jot down uh, things that they might need, and maybe other people can say, "Oh, I can help with that," or and not be surprised that the stress isn't just from work. So you may find, and the stress first aid model supports this, that we do not focus just on work stress. The model focuses also on home stress. And you may find when you start asking about stress that it's not just about work stress. It's always, it's always uh, what we've seen also related to things that are happening at home or with extended family or that type of thing. And then finding ways to show support in whatever way makes most sense depending on the time frame and what's going on with you, finding ways to ask more questions, finding ways to inform staff about what you're learning about, maybe a daily briefing, a daily email, whatever it is, um, more clarity, maybe you're informing them about work policies because they're probably changing on a regular basis and giving people information about the, the new routines, any way that they can feel more in control, that type of thing. There will be no formula for making allowances. Um, every organization is going to have to do this differently and it will change over time. And then we have information about helping people that might need additional support about how you may need to be more flexible and patient with them, maybe discuss different options for taking breaks, um, uh, that type of thing. Um, always acknowledging um, that you believe in the person. And again, this depends on the situation, but showing that you uh, believe that, that even though they're going through a difficult time, they can get through this um, and they may need, you may need to make allowances, but that you're reminding them about their strengths and about their track record and about whatever it is that, that lets you show them that you believe in them. It's also important to, again, be a role model um, of how you deal with stress. Um, and that also means being a role model at seeking out help when you need it. Um, the difficult thing about leadership in times like this is that it's such a new situation that it may be hard to find mentors and peers. And it may be that you're doing that by looking online at YouTube videos or things that people are posting from other hospitals who are in leadership roles, that type of thing. But whatever it is, you may need to also model that you know, it's important to take small breaks to, you know, listen to a two minute guided imagery or calm down or check in with family or whatever it is that's needed. And then uh, also important to know when to advise and refer people. They may need more help than what you can give. So um, we have all this information in the handout. We also have a note that it's very, very important to practice self-care for yourself. We always remind people when we give trainings that one of the key words with the stress first aid model is longevity. We have a very precious commodity, a very precious resource with health healthcare workers around the world. This is a group of people who care, who want to serve, who want to help others, and they are very much worth trying to preserve and have for the long term. So we uh, very, very important with leaders as well. You have worked your way through a system. And if it means that you have to take a regular look at checks and balances for yourself, uh, kind of a cost benefit analysis to remind yourself why it's important to take care of yourself, we would highly encourage that. Um, and lastly, in our, um, in our document, we have an example of a, a potential email or a, a communication that leadership could give to the staff conveying support just as a template for you to use. Um, we also have in the handouts a, 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 a handout on moral injury that's specific to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. We have tips for providing support to others and we also have a handout on helpful thinking because what we've seen with the healthcare workers is that they often get stuck in patterns of thought that normally are fine. They actually motivate them. Things like, you know, I other I put the needs of others before my own, and it's important for me to keep working harder. Generally, that supports healthcare workers in their job and it keeps them going. But in situations like this, those types of thoughts may need to be adjusted slightly to be more helpful so that a person doesn't get into a situation where they're 
overworking to the extent that they then have a uh, some sort of crash in their energy or their ability to do what they need to do. So that handout is in there as well with suggested thoughts that might be adaptations or your typical thoughts. And um, I will not go into the rest of the slides, but the reason that we, we have the rest of the slides here are that these are a resource for you. These are potential strategies that we've gathered from different settings, and they include, um, if, you, if you just look at the next slide, for instance, they include things that some of the people that we've spoken with have said have been helpful as ways of, of doing each one of these core actions. I also want to bring your attention to the fact that we put a yellow circle by the ones that are particularly important for leaders. Leaders should be should and could be doing all of these, but ones that are in yellow um, are, are particularly helpful for leaders. And we also have um, on the next slide um, examples of ways to check in with somebody. The next slide has examples of potential group questions that Richard had already mentioned as a way to engage a group. Um, and the slide after that as well has some uh, particular uh, questions that you could potentially use for group questions. So I will now um, stop and turn the presentation back over to Beth for questions. Thank you so much, Patricia and Richard. Very, very helpful material and suggestions, real life on the ground experience. It's really, it's so valuable. Uh, we have had some questions, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about this concept of moral injury and moral distress. Uh, we know that, for example, for people on the front lines, they're experiencing this when they feel that uh, they wish they could provide more resources, they wish they could uh, have more uh, ventilators available, more time to discuss goals of care, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so they're feeling that what they would like to do isn't possible in the current circumstances. I, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that. And also, here's part two. How does this apply to leaders? What are some of the moral challenges that you see now uh, being experienced by managers, uh, unit directors, and leadership? So a two-part question, more on moral injury, and then how does this apply to leaders? Well, thank you very much for the question, and that can be a couple webinars in and of itself, so <laughs> we'll, we'll try to be uh, succinct here. Uh, the idea of uh, moral injury is that when there's moral distress, that creates a moral ethical challenge that individuals need to navigate. And as we navigate moral distress, we use a moral compass, we use our beliefs, we use cultural normative values, we use organization policies and procedures as a, a template or a litmus that we compare our decisions uh, uh, against. And so what happens with uh, when moral distress uh, is a challenging uh, experience, it becomes potentially injurious when the individual has difficulty navigating who am I now that I've had the experience that I've had. And we see moral uh, injury occurring uh, in two types of uh, time frames. One is in the moment, here and now, making decisions around triage, uh, making decisions about who gets uh, PPE, who gets uh, uh, treatment, who doesn't. Uh, these are moral ethical challenges in the moment. We need to also be prepared for the emergence of moral injury as time goes on. When we reflect back and the, the echoes of moral injury are could have, should have, ought of, if only. And so we find that people make the best decision they can in the moment that they have, and then the potential of reflecting on it, saying, geez, that, that was something I really could have made a, a different decision on. In regards to uh, leadership, that there, there's challenges for leadership around moral distress in that often leaders get to peer behind the curtain of their organization. 
uh, the supplies coming in, uh, the demand on, on the individuals, and many of the decisions that leaders need to make that are morally and ethically challenging may not be issues that they can share more broadly within the organization or with anybody else. And so one of the things that we found most certainly in the Department of Defense and working with sailors and Marines was there was a type of code of silence that came with moral injury. And that is not talking about it, not sharing. And that becomes potentially caustic when we start thinking about shame and blame and the impact on our values. So it's gonna be really important for organizations, individuals and peers to have a framework where they can talk about the moral ethical challenges that they're facing in the moment, even when there is no good choice or good answer. Patricia, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Yes, I would. Um, thank you. Um, and there is a lot more detail in the moral injury handout, as I, as I said, uh, includes um, how you can think about this uh, for yourself, how you can help coworkers, and also there's a section on how leaders can help with moral injury. But for me, the short version is, um, I think that it helps particularly for leaders to have an approach and to, to, to normalize that this in particular is going to be a time when there's absolutely no way we can do things the way we typically do things. And the messages should be, we're doing the best we can with what we have from moment to moment to moment. And that's going to change from moment to moment to moment. We are in this together. We're all doing the best we can. We are taking this step by step. We're taking a lessons learned approach versus a punitive approach because everyone is operating with, you know, uh, uh, potential handicaps in a system like this. And where you start to see people doing the woulda, coulda, shoulda. This is the one area I would not say that Dr. Phil is my you know, top role model when it comes to mental health practitioners. However, I do like one thing that he says, and that is, how's that working for you? So if a person is continually putting themselves in a rut over what they're saying to themselves, and again, it goes back to the helpful thinking handout I mentioned, the, the stance and the attitude should be, I understand, I completely see it's very understandable to me that you would be feeling that way, but at this moment, how is it working for you and how is it working for the people around you? Is there something else that you could be saying and thinking right now that would keep you moving, keep you functioning? And we may need to put those thoughts aside right now and focus on what we can do from moment to moment to moment. Just focus on what's next, what you can do to make a difference at this moment, rather than getting stuck in second guessing, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking, looking back and saying, I should have done it differently because it will in this, it reminds me of the I Love Lucy episode where they were eating, they were in the candy factory and they were able to wrap the candies when the conveyor belt was slow. But as this speeds up, if you're continually stuck in those thought processes, those candies are gonna be going right past you. You will not be able to wrap the next thing in front of you because you're still stuck in the thought patterns. So very, very important to just normalize. I, I very much understand that you'd be feeling that way. However, let's focus on what we can do day to day to day and keep this kind of lessons learned approach. We are all in this together. You will have people on your staff that have very different ways to approach this too and, and take that into account. So some people with moral injury, it's gonna drive them into themselves and they're gonna be more likely to go in the, the into the direction of really looking at the meaning this has for them, looking at their values, looking at their religion, looking at their faith or their philosophy, and it's gonna drive them into a deeper process with that. And what we see in the literature is that that's actually could potentially be one of, one of the positive outcomes of a horrendous experience, is that people grow, they learn, they reformulate their priorities, and they, they, they find new ways of being in the world. And other people, that's not the direction they're gonna go, and that's not who they are. They're much more kind of, practical, pragmatic, and they're gonna go in the direction of being an advocate. They're gonna take what they've learned and they're gonna say, all right, I'm gonna try and make a difference in the world. I'm gonna to try to take these lessons learned and I'm gonna to try to make change with systems or with people. And that's okay, you'll have different people doing different things. So uh, you don't need to impose any particular thing to do about this, but 
your job would be to try to find ways to move them in the direction of making use of this and staying in the moment. So I'll stop there. Mm, it's so helpful, though. Thank you so much, both of you. I know this is um, this is a difficult situation. Some of the things you're you're saying are so helpful. We're doing the best we can. I do think it is changing people's assumptions about who they are, and there is potential for rumination there. There's also potential for post-traumatic growth, um, and so we're we're hoping to see more of of the latter than the former. What happens though? Um, and I, I think a lot of people are, are wondering what to do about this. Social cohesion is so important, but what if you're in a place where there is a sort of a, a, a mismatch uh, to phase, as you talked about, Patricia, and the staff recognize that they want to do things differently, but um, A, there's not the opportunity to implement that because they're being told that they have to do things in a previous way or things, whatever customary um, uh, processes and strategies have been used. So what happens if there's kind of like a, a BQ mismatch between where the frontline staff is at and where the directors or managers or the leadership is at? How do you regain that sense of um, togetherness or help people realign? So th this is Richard. I'd like to um, provide some uh, information here that we've learned by uh, with rolling out the uh, uh, stress first aid and wisdom practices within healthcare organizations. And this is one of the advantages of the stress continuum where we've had teams on units and unit managers to be able to declare this process is orange zone. It is not functioning. It's not helping us deliver the care that we need to deliver. And notice what happens is that the, the stressor is reframed as either something that is adding stress or it's growing the green. It's something that makes the unit function uh, better or it's, it's orange zone. And so for some teams and when man, senior management teams have been able to integrate the stress continuum within to the context of organizational and unit functioning, it creates a different dialogue. It's not about people complaining. It's not about individuals asking leaders to do something that leaders can't do because the supplies aren't there but it creates a basis for having a dialogue. What's going on that's taking us away from uh, normal uh, uh, operating uh, tempo? What's uh, going on that's putting us in the orange zone? So that's one strategy about using this model to have difficult conversations while reducing stigma and reducing blaming. Patricia, do you want to, thank you, Richard. Do you have any other comments as well? I think that's really helpful, actually. You know, what will help us move forward rather than shame and blame? Patricia, right. we have maybe another minute or two. Sure. I would just, I would only add to that that um, leadership is not just, does not just emerge through the formal structures of leadership within an organization. There are many informal leaders in organizations, and they generally yeah. have certain social skills and that type of thing to bring people together to be able to get a survey of what people need and to find a way to convey that uh, to upper level or other people that can actually affect change in an organization. So mm -hmm. this would be a time when natural leaders, no matter what level they're at in the official structure, could start to emerge. And again, if they have this approach of, all right, what can we do to make this better? It tends to um, move things forward rather than getting stuck in the venting. Um, again, mm -hmm. I say everything, every comment that I've made on this entire webinar, I'm very careful not to um, convey that this will work at every time in every situation, but this is one mm -hmm. thing that, that I've seen with, with uh, leadership emerging in times of stress, that certain people come forward who are problem solvers, who are able to band people together, who are able to you know, bring ideas forward in a way that, that uh, is positive and um, helpful. Time for the emergence uh, phase that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, well, we have 
to wrap up, I, I want to thank you both so very, very much for sharing your your wisdom, your knowledge, your your deep experience and expertise with all of us. Um, I'm going to turn this back over to Stephanie. She's going to uh, give you a heads up about what's coming. Steph, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks so much, Beth. And thanks so much to Dr. Westfall and Dr. Watson for a really outstanding presentation. Um, the response was outstanding as well. And I do apologize if we weren't able to get to everyone's questions. Um, we will be posting the presentation along with the handouts on our website with a recording of the web webinar within about 24 hours. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, and with that, I'm just going to ask you all to save the date for our next up webinars coming over the next couple of weeks. We'll be doing these about every week um, over the next month or so, um, because we really see just a huge demand and a need to have these conversations. And we've had some really wonderful speakers sign on to join us for them. So next week, we'll have Dr. Susan David talking about emotional agility. She's a psychologist, an author, and a huge TED Talker. So that should be fantastic. And Dr. Watson and Dr. Westfall will be back with us at the end of the month to talk about how we adapt this work to support our patients and families. I know there were a couple of questions about that. So if those were your questions, I hope you'll be able to join us for that session. Um, and until then, I think that's it. Just one more request to please fill out our survey when you exit the webinar. Um, and if you do want to move, uh, sorry, if you do want to learn more about the work we do at the Schwartz Center, um, please do visit us at theschwartzcenter.org. If you're part of a member organization, um, there's lots more that we're doing to support our member community. Um, and we are just so grateful to all of you for the work that you're doing. So thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care.